Okay, welcome to note set number 33 where we're going to be talking about the Laplace transform. You'll notice that we're back to continuous time systems. Uh, we said that the Z transform was the power tool for system analysis for discrete time. Laplace transform is the power tool that we'll be using for continuous time system analysis. Now a lot of the ideas will be very similar, uh, at least at the big picture level, <clears throat> but the, some of the details will be um, different between the Z transform and the Laplace transform. But the basic big ideas are the same, so that works in your favor. Um, just like we did for Z transform, uh, there's going to be two things that we're going to be doing. First, we're going to be using the Laplace transform to characterize the so-called transfer function. Same idea that we had for discrete time, uh, just um, uh, with a slightly different tool. Uh, and then just like we just finished for um, uh, discrete time systems, we'll be able to solve differential equations with non-zero initial conditions, and we'll do that much much later, uh, maybe four or five uh, lectures into the future here. Okay, uh, we had the uh, Z-transform definition. Uh, you can compare and contrast um, everything that we do here for Laplace transform. Uh, the, the big concepts are the same. So for discrete time, we talked about how the discrete time Fourier transform and the Z-transform were related. Same kind of thing here. We have the CTFT, continuous time Fourier transform, looks like this. Uh, and we've seen how we can use that to analyze systems by looking at x of omega times h of omega to give us the output Fourier transform. Now, the only problem is that um, there are some signals as well as some systems for which this Fourier transform does not exist, meaning that this integral does not converge to something. Now, quote unquote, converge, remember that integrals are defined in a limit of uh, sums, uh, if you go back to your calc class. Um, so we don't really have to concern ourselves too much with the with the uh, you know calculus details of it, but the point is is that for some cases, uh, this the x of t that you know you'll have an x of t that when you plug it in there, um, you can't actually mathematically f ever find uh, the integral, no matter how hard you work. It just it it's what mathematicians say it does not exist. Um, now, so the La the Laplace transform helps us deal with this problem by uh, replacing the e to the minus j omega t um, by something that we'll call e to the st, where s is a complex number that we'll define as real part we'll call sigma, and the imaginary part we'll call omega. And so if we plug in uh, that, that definition for s, we get uh, this kind of thing. And then when we split them apart, we see that we get the, the same thing that we had for, um, for um, the Fourier transform, although you know, technically we should be talking about e to the minus s here, and we'd have e to the minus sigma and e to the minus j omega t. Um, and what we would see is that by choosing sigma, we can make this whole thing uh, decay if, if necessary. Uh, therefore, when we plug in e to the minus st up here, we can then um, control or force this integral to converge for a wider class of, of signals. So um, like I wrote up there, we, we have our s variable. s is equal to sigma plus plus j omega. Uh, so s is just a, a complex variable. And we will almost always think of it in terms of its rectangular form, uh, unlike z, which we almost always kept in polar form. So if we make this change, e to the minus j omega t gets changed to e to the minus st. Um, you can see the similarities between the Laplace transform and the Fourier transform. Uh, just like we could see the similarities between the z transform and the DTFT. 
So just like for Z transform, there's two types of Laplace transforms that we'll worry about, two-sided or bilateral, one-sided or unilateral. So the two-sided, uh, the key thing is that we integrate from minus infinity up to infinity. And for the one-sided, uh, the important restriction is that we only integrate from zero up to infinity. Um, even if we happen to put in a signal that is non-zero, um, down in the region that we're not integrating over. If we have such a signal, we can still say this is its one-sided Laplace transform. It doesn't include all the information in x of t, um, but um, it still would be valid to say that is its one-sided Laplace transform. Now the thing that we'll be dealing with, or the, the reason we'll be using the one-sided, um, we'll use that later to handle the initial conditions of our system. So the system's previously been doing something, so it, it has an output for t less than zero already, um, and we just need to be able to um, analyze uh, what happens after using the Laplace transform, but we'll need some mechanism to include in the initial conditions, just like we did with the z transform. So that, that's the basic idea. Okay, um, let's see, did I skip something there? No, I guess that's it. Um, so once we get the Laplace transform of something, x of s, um, it's a complex valued function, uh, just like um, the Fourier transform is. But now it's a complex valued function over a complex variable. So unlike the Fourier transform, which we could plot on a single axis, um, we now have to plot the Laplace transform over a complex plane. For the Z transform, we had the Z plane, and for the Laplace transform, we have the S plane. Um, so uh, I don't know if my artistic ability is, is uh, sufficient here, but uh, these two axes are defining a plane, and then this is coming up um, perpendicular to that plane. Um, so you can think of, you know, these two defining some sort of tabletop, and then this is sticking straight up out of that tabletop. Um, so we, we would need still two plots, the magnitude over this plane and the phase over this plane, although mostly we look at the magnitude. Um, now, for the Z transform, uh, we kept things in polar form because we needed to keep track of Z values that were inside the unit circuit circle and z values that were outside the unit circle. So looking at the magnitude of the z was um, important. But for, for Laplace, what we care about is whether things are on the so-called left half plane, so that um, we always put our, our real axis like this, our imaginary axis like this. So the left half of the plane is over here where the real part is negative. Um, so um, we need to keep track of those two half planes and it makes sense to keep things in terms of rectangular form so that we can easily ask whether the real part is um, positive or negative. So that's one tiny little distinction between Z transform analysis and Laplace transform analysis. Now just like for the Z transform, uh, we have to worry sometimes about this thing called region of convergence. Uh, and basically, um, as we said, we use the e to the minus st, and we can control the sigma value to um, determine, or at least to force, the Laplace transform integral to converge for a wider class of signals. So for a given signal, there's going to be certain values of s um, for which that integral works, and certain values of s for which that integral does not work. Uh, and so the, the, the values of s for which the integral converges is called the region of convergence. Um, and, you know, we're not going to fuss too much about that um, in this course. If you go on to more advanced uh, signal processing courses, uh, you'll, you'll worry about that, and, and maybe some controls courses as well. So let's take a look at a, at a signal e to the minus b t u of t. Now when we did the 4a transform of this, we required that b was greater than zero in order for the Fourier transform to exist. And that all that did was make sure that this was a decaying exponential. But now with Laplace, we're free to allow b to be positive or negative. Um, 
And uh, so that means that the Laplace transform is not restricted to dealing with just decaying exponentials, but can also deal with exploding exponentials as well. Um, so um, applying our definition, uh, we're applying the, the double-sided uh, uh, Laplace transform. So we'll, we'll do the two-sided here. Um, but you'll see that we are already limiting ourselves to zero. That's because of the u of t. Um, and then we have two exponentials, so we can combine those following um, rules of exponentials. And that's an easy integral to do. And uh, when we get this t equal to infinity, we have to remember that what that's really saying is to take the limit as t goes to infinity. When we have t equal to 0, we just sub, sub in t equal to 0, and we get the minus 1. So whether this integral exists or not depends on whether this limit exists. So we need to uh, look at that limit to uh, determine uh, when this algor or algorithm, when this integral exists and when it doesn't. And, and that's this region of convergence issue. So uh, this is the thing that we're looking at the limit of. And so if we expand that out, we plug in our uh, sigma plus j omega for s, and we get something that looks like this. And we can see that there are two main behaviors of this, depending on how sigma and b uh, are interrelated. So if sigma plus b is greater than 0, in other words, if sigma is greater than minus b, then um, this thing will, will decay down. It may oscillate um, because of the omega value, uh, but nonetheless it decays down, and then the limit exists. The limit goes to 0. But if, on the other hand, uh, sigma is less than minus b, then this thing is going to explode, and that limit does not exist. We don't know. What, I mean, not only is it going uh, off without bound, but it also is oscillating back and forth between two growing um, without bound uh, boundaries. Um, so only for this case does that limit exist, and that tells us what our region of convergence needs to be for this particular signal. Um, so um, this set of s is the region of convergence, all s such that the real part of s is greater than minus b. So what we have is the Laplace transform of this thing has this form, but that form uh, really only makes sense if we limit ourselves to looking at the real s greater than minus b. And so just like we've had for all of our other transforms, we've got a table of transforms here that um, allow us to um, deal with these things pretty easily without having to do all this math. So just uh, kind of summarizing what we've got here. So if b is greater than 0, uh, this signal that we've been looking at in this example decays down. Um, and we know that we can handle this case by the Fourier transform, but we can also handle it with the Laplace transform. And so for this case, since b is greater than 0, minus b is negative. So on our, uh, if we put my, uh, a line here, a vertical line that tells us where sigma equal to minus b is, and then we've said that the region of convergence is all the s values whose real part is um, greater than minus b, so that's all these over to the right-hand side. Uh, and we will notice here, uh, and we'll bring this up again later, that for this scenario, the region of convergence actually includes the j omega line. Uh, and that'll be important in just a, a little bit. Now, if b is less than 0, then um, x of t explodes exponentially. And what that means is minus b is positive. So if we do the same kind of thing, um, we draw our vertical line at sigma equal to minus b. That line is going to be um, to the right of the j omega axis. And so our region of convergence is over here. Now, um, we already know that this is a case that cannot be handled by, um, by the Fourier transform. And just in passing, we'll, we'll come back to this, notice that um, e to the minus st, that's the thing that's inside our Laplace transform, <clears throat> if we limit ourselves to just this j omega axis, becomes e to the minus j omega t. That's the thing that's inside 
the um, Fourier transform. So when we have this situation, we are allowed to look at s values that give us that. Um, and that's why the Fourier transform exists for that case. But for this case, um, we're not able to um, uh, restrict ourselves to this because it's not in the region of convergence. So we'll come back to that, um, in fact, right on this slide. So um, there is a connection between the CTFT and the Laplace transform. You can see that connection uh, uh, exposed there. If we set sigma equal to zero, it looks like the Laplace transform um, degenerates into the continuous time Fourier transform, but we're only allowed to make this transition from the Laplace back to the continuous time Fourier transform for signals such that the region of convergence includes the J omega axis. That makes sense. If we set sigma equal to zero and that particular value of s, so in other words, the j omega axis is not in the region of convergence, it's telling us that this integral does not exist and we cannot use the CTFT as a tool. Um, so as long as our region of convergence includes j omega axis, um, then we're able to find the Fourier transform by essentially slicing the Laplace transform um, along the j omega axis where sigma is equal to zero. And, and we've got a nice picture here that's showing how we would do that. So um, this is that Laplace transform we've been looking at um, for the case of a decaying exponential. Um, and um, the, the red line, the red curve there is showing uh, the um, outline of the Laplace transform magnitude anyway um, on the, the, the j omega axis. And so if we were to um, slice the, the, the Laplace transform and look at, look at um, this, this red line, uh, we would get this, this curve here. Um, as a function of omega. So this is very similar to what we had for uh, z-transform. There we had to worry about whether the unit circle was in the region of convergence. And if you remember, we sliced around the, the unit circle and then we cut at the minus pi pi and unfolded. Well, all that idea carries over here, except there's no cutting and unfolding. And there's no resulting periodicity of the, of the Fourier transform like we saw for the DTFT. Um, so again, big ideas carry over with a few tiny little differences. So if we revisit this example that we had before, um, this kind of thing, we saw that we had x of s, and this described the region of convergence. Um, so when um, b is greater than 0, then this thing is decaying. We know the Fourier transform exists. Um, and we see that the j omega axis lies inside the region of convergence. Um, and so then we're free to, re to evaluate the Laplace transform on the j omega axis. So that mathematically means replace s by j omega. Um, so we're going to take this s and replace it by j omega. And so now we get 1 over j omega plus b. And if you look at um, this result on the Fourier transform table for explicitly positive b, you'll find that we had exactly the same result on that Fourier transform table. Now we had an inverse Fourier transform, we have an inverse DTFT, we had an inverse Z transform, and yes, there's an inverse Laplace transform. Um, there it is. It's pretty ugly. It's a complex line integral. Um, it's, it's hard and nasty to do, so you don't really want to have to do it if you don't have to do it. Um, fortunately, just like we did for Z transforms, um, we can, at least for the case where um, where the uh, uh, z transform is a um, rational function of s, meaning a ratio of two polynomials, we can use partial fraction expansion uh, to break this down into things that will be on our table. Um, so that's what you would be expe expected to be able to do. Um, you already know how to do partial fraction expansion um, because we learned that for z transform. Now the only difference is for the z-transform, before we did the partial fraction expansion, we divided by z and then um, 
after expanding we multiplied back through by that z we don't have to do that for s so you just take your x of s you do partial fraction expansion directly on that um, and then do the inverse Laplace transform uh, of each of the resulting terms so it's it's a little bit easier so so here's an example suppose we're given an output uh, of a system uh, in the Laplace domain we're told y of s is the Laplace transform of the output of a system uh, find y of t so we want to do an inverse Laplace transform of this so we do our partial fraction expansion this one you could do by hand since there's no repeated roots no direct terms no complex um, poles uh, so this one is actually pretty easy to do by hand um, and for such a case um, we, we would have um, three terms like this since this is a third order um, system and notice that since we don't have a constant out here there is one s that can be factored out that corresponds to the pole at the origin um, so just like before you should be uh, quite comfortable with this um, expanding this out like this and, and then we um, get something that looks like this uh, and we're going to do uh, the inverse Laplace transform we would look up each of these terms uh, so uh, each of these terms transforms into uh, something that is on the table or transforms back um, and so um, we, we get that that kind of thing um, and you'll notice that um, these things these factors have roots that are um, not positive well let's just talk about the uh, the two that I have circled there s plus half and s plus quarter they each have negative roots um, so the negative roots mean that they end up decaying um, and so that's a common thing that we'll see and uh, that comes from uh, stable systems with with poles that are in the so-called left half side of the plane uh, and we'll talk more about that later so I'm um, just giving a uh, preview of things to come so uh, just like all of our other transforms we've got a bunch of properties we're only going to talk about the the most important ones here but you should review all of the properties and be familiar with them linearity is just like all the other pro uh, for all the other transforms that we've seen uh, time shift seems to be an important one that that shows up a lot although um, uh, you know it's extremely important for the Z transform less so for the Laplace transform um, so uh, this is for a, a causal signal I'm showing it for a causal signal but the result I'm about to write is is for the general case um, so a delay or um, it doesn't matter whether it's shift left or shift right uh, we take e to the minus CS time times X of s um, and you'll notice that um, that's very similar to what we had for Fourier transform so for Fourier transform uh, instead of having e to the minus CS we have e to the minus J omega C uh, and like I said there's several other properties they're all listed on the table of Laplace transform properties that I've made available to you now the most important property is the time differentiation property uh, and and here we're we're um, really dealing with with the bilateral um, Laplace transform we'll we'll talk about the the unilateral uh, version later so this this is for two-sided explicitly um, now what this says is that differentiation in the time domain corresponds to multiplication by an s uh, in, in the Laplace domain and um, the other nice result is that if I integrate uh, and, and actually I should make this minus infinity uh, to infinity or minus infinity up to T if I integrate that thing um, then uh, I get a, a, a time function take the Laplace transform of that that corresponds to 1 over s times x of s so just like we think about differentiation and and running integration as being um, opposites of each other um, we, we see that uh, carrying over into the Laplace domain uh, differentiation is multiply by s integration is divide by s 
Um, and when you get into a, a, a course on control systems, uh, you will uh, be thinking in terms of S's and 1 over S's um, when you think about a control system in terms of its block diagram. We're not going to dwell on that too much here. Now the the system property, we've seen this for uh, all of our other transforms already. Um, the system property says that um, if the output of a Laplace tra of a LTI system uh, is y of s, um, that y of s is found by taking x of s times h of s, where h of s is um, the so-called transfer function of the system. Uh, and we'll explore what that transfer function is and, and how we get it in, in just a little bit. Um, so um, once you have the transfer function of the system and you know its input in the Laplace domain, all you do is take the product, you get the Laplace transform of the output, and then you do, <laughs> that should be an S, you do an inverse Laplace transform on that to get a, a, a Y, to get your Y of T. But just like we did for H of omega, um, we're not necessarily interested in doing that last step of doing the inverse, although it's nice to be able to do that for some simple cases. What we're interested in is looking at H of S to get some uh, insight into the behavior of the system. Um, so we saw a similar kind of thing for the CTFT, and, and given our knowledge now that there's uh, a linkage uh, between CTFT and LT, uh, this is not surprising. So uh, just some terminology, this, this H of omega is called the frequency response of the system, and this H of S is called the transfer function of the system. Um, so we'll be exploring uh, the transfer function and its link to the frequency response a lot in the next several lectures. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next video.